the University of Brighton, which I found out is not the University of Sussex. <laughs> She's a research fellow and a PhD student there. And um, her current research, which is not what she's about to talk about, is on um, participation, value-based indicators, and sustainability. Um, you can ask her about that afterwards, because it's really interesting. Um, in the past, she's worked in Tanzania for more than a decade, um, where she was the founding trustee of the linked NGOs Ang Serian, House of Peace, and Serian UK, um, where she co-designed innovative education and research projects with Maasai community representatives, and she helped to establish a thriving intercultural secondary school in a remote village. Okay. So, sounds pretty awesome. Um, and she's, like, she's also the co-author of several diverse publications on health, environment, gender, and development issues. So you can ask her about all of those afterwards. Okay, I am going to talk to you about values-based indicators, but in relation to the Millennium Development Goals, um, if anybody wants to hear more about the school in Tanzania, you can grab me afterwards, because I much prefer talking about that, but I thought that I was supposed to be talking about the NDGs here. Um, so I'm going to talk about this idea of a fourth pillar of sustainability. Um, there have been lots of different discourses in literature that say actually the current idea of sustainable development has consisted of three pillars. You have this idea of social, environmental and economic. It's actually missing something really big. Um, there's not total consensus on what that something is. Uh, there are a lot of people saying it should be culture. Um, UNESCO has done a lot of work, and there are lots. Uh, FAO also talks about it. Culture as the fourth pillar of sustainability, and in fact, cultural aesthetic dimension. You've got and within the Earth Charter process, religious groups saying actually it's a religious spiritual pillar that's missing, and you've also got another whole strand of people saying it's actually political and institutional, and it, it, it's all about how well institutions are, fo are functioning and good governance and so on. So nobody really agrees what the fourth pillar is. But if you look at these three different perspectives, what they all seem to have in common is human values. Um, what are values? Well, these are two definitions. There are, there are 153 definitions of value, according to a paper recently written by a, a Czech colleague of ours. But th these are two from the Oxford Dictionary, which I think are quite useful. Uh, principles or standards of behaviour, or what people judge to be important in life. And you find that the, the first one kind of implies the second, because if somebody is setting principles or standards of behaviour that's based in a certain understanding of what matters in life, you behave in a certain way in order to attain something you see as important. And so just a quick look, this is a very quick whistle-stop tour, I'm not going to read these out, but I'll just put these up for you to look at. Um, so international documents which are concerned with values, this is the Earth Charter in 2000, and so they talk about urgently needing a shared vision, and they talk about interdependent principles, which they say should be a common standard of behaviour for everyone. So I, I can send this around to anyone who wants it, so don't worry about trying to frantically scribble it all down. These are some of the, these are the core principles that were identified by the Earth Charter. So respect and care for the community of life, um, incorporating both the human and non-human life, um, ecological integrity, social and economic justice, and the fourth one is democracy, non-violence, and peace. So these are the principles of the Earth Charter. Millennium Declaration, around about the same time, had similar sorts of ideas about what was important. And they say that these fundamental values are essential to international relations, and similar sorts of things, freedom, equality, solidarity, tolerance, respect for nature, shared responsibility. This, which I'm not even going to try to read, is UNESCO's idea of what values underlie sustainable development. This is from the decade, uh, the International Implementation Scheme, IIS, on the Decade for Education for Sustainable Development, DESD. So this is UNESCO trying to, to, to see what they think is important in terms of education for sustainable development. And as if these weren't enough, they've added these in 2010. So there's plenty to, to get your teeth into there, the values underlying ESD. Um, th this is from a paper that I'm working on at the moment. I won't go into it too much because I'm worried I'm going to run out of time. But um, a lot of people think that these values can't possibly be measured um, because they say that you can't define them objectively. And if you can't define something objectively, you can't operationalise it as indicators. Therefore, you can't create indicators for values. Um, this is an alternative argument which we've developed in our, in our group, uh, in Sustainable Development Coordination Unit in Brighton. We're looking at uh, tra different ways of measuring values. And this came out of a European Union funded project. So what we're saying is that you may not be able to get an objective definition, but you can get what we call an intersubjective definition. And I'll show you a little bit about how that works in a minute. So you can define values if you have a, a clearly defined practical context. So within a school, for example, you can talk about what's important to the stakeholders within that school. 
Or if your context is a national level, you could try and have a process of public consultation, although it's a lot more complicated. The bigger it gets, the harder it gets to manage. But if you have a defined context, the idea is that you can define values within that context, and you can then make indicators that are relevant to that context. So that this was our conclusion, that you can actually measure values. And what I mean by values enactment is the way that people actually put their values into practice. So just going back to these for a second, the ways that some of these things are lived. Obviously, different people would understand them very differently, but if you can try and build consensus within a defined context, then you can start to think about what it would look like in practice. So what I mean by intersubjective understanding of values, you can have a word, and this is called a symbol, or a value label, we call this a value label. So you can have a word like equality. Um, in English, um, say if you're working in different languages, you would have a different symbol. But in English, you have the word equality. Um, the group can then create a meaning for equality. Each person would start off with their own individual meaning of it in their head. But as a group, you can sit together and think about what that would mean to you as a group. And then you can come up with what we call reference, which are actual real-world behaviours and perceptions that might constitute indicators of equality. So, for example, if everyone has the same opportunities to do a certain thing, you might see that as an indicator of equality. Somebody else might see it very differently. But as a group, the idea is that you can actually come up with an intersubjective meaning. So, this system of what we call values-focused evaluation starts with the values, what's important for the school, what's important for the organisation. Then you get on to something that we call proto-indicators. And proto-indicators are kind of prototypes of measurable indicators that you can use. They're not measurable yet because they still need more development and more work. But they're your initial ideas, if you like, about how that, what, what that might look like in practice. And then you can create from there indicators and assessment tools, which are about how you measure it. So here's an example. Um, a proto-indicator could be expressing their own opinions. This could be something that in a conversation has come out as important. Um, the actual indicators, you've got two alternatives here. So teachers actively express, uh, sorry, actively encourage students to express their own opinions, or students encourage peers to express their own opinions. So starting from here, you've got two different indicators. And then you can think about how you would measure those indicators. So you could have somebody coming in from outside, a non-participant actually observing the class and specifically looking out for these things. So watching the teacher and saying, well, does she encourage or does he encourage students to express their own opinions? Watching the students and see what they do. Or you could have a mixture of peer assessment and self-assessment. So you could ask the students to assess each other. You could ask them to reflect on how well they were doing this themselves. So this is the, these are sort of the basic principles of values-focused evaluation. This is how the research process worked. This came out of a two-year um, research project funded by the European Union, which is called the ESDINS project, which, which I can you know, give you the website at the end. Um, so the primary data that they first used to get this pool, if you like, of proto-indicators came from lots of different sources. The main one was interviews, but they also looked at documents, they did surveys, they looked at websites. So there was a lot of research done. Uh, the original project was with civil society organisations. We're, we're now starting to work with, with schools and with educators. In the beginning it was much more about charities and NGOs. So you collect the pool of primary data, there's some literature work that goes on, there's a developing the code book and doing the coding of all the data. Um, you work with partner organisations to actually get them to say, yes, we think this is important, or actually, no, we don't know where you're coming from with this so that you have what we call face validity. So it's an approach which is valid to the people involved. And you get a preliminary list of proto-indicators, and then from there you can work with organisations to develop indicators and assessment tools in the field. And you have this sort of iterative process of, of testing and development of the indicators. So here's just a couple of examples of proto-indicators. They're not measurable until you have a specific context in which to measure them. But these are some statements from the data, just two randomly chosen ones. Once one person said a good school is one with zero tolerance of bullying. Uh, somebody else says an ethos of students taking responsibility for their own learning. Um, so the project that I wanted to talk about particularly is called PEARL, which is called, it's short for Partnership of edu for Education and Research for Responsible Living. And it's a partnership of educators and researchers from about 120 institutions in, about, in over 50 different countries. And it's an EU-funded project under the Erasmus scheme, and it's working to empower citizens to live responsible and sustainable lifestyles. So that there's already been a Pearl One, there's been a, an initial phase of this project, which we had no direct involvement with. 
the current phase is called Pearl 2. It's just been launched. We had a meeting in Marseille in March. And uh, the meeting was for members of working groups, 10 different working groups. And our working group, which is called WG1, work group one, is called Bridging the Knowledge Action Gap by helping teachers and learners to reflect on their values. And so the aim of this work group is to develop a toolkit that can actually be used in secondary schools throughout the European Union and ultimately beyond the European Union. The Pearl Network includes lots of partners from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. But the focus of this project, I think mainly because of the funder, is Europe. <coughs> so what we tried to do was to compile six different sources of data about what educators regard as important. And the first one was some field notes from a conference that I attended in 2011 in Ireland. And the conference was called Reimagining Learning, and it was organized by an NGO called Educate Together. And so this, this was educators who were deliberately trying to, to push the boundaries and think particularly about education for sustainable development. So I was interested in what they saw as important as a group that's slightly on the, on the fringes of, of mainstream education. And so a few notes from that conference, and I also gave a questionnaire to the conference delegates, of whom there were over 100, I unfortunately got 11 questionnaires back. Mm -hmm. But so that's pretty much the norm, I think, when you give things out at conferences. Um, so we had those two, we were both from that, which was specifically ESD and non-mainstream approaches. I, I did some interviews with teachers at the school in Tanzania, um, which was, uh, it's, it's a non-governmental school, but uh, supported mostly um, by UK charity. And uh, I interviewed them about what they regarded as important in education, what they saw as a good school, uh, to come up with some positive experiences when they felt they were making a difference and so on. So we have that data set. Um, some of my colleagues interviewed lecturers at the University of Brighton of what they found good, meaningful or important in their work. So we have a higher education context as well. Um, we had the same questionnaire that I'd given to the Irish educators, which was asking people to think about positive and negative um, experience they had with education and thinking about the values underlying it. So we gave that to the work group members within the Pearl project as well. And also a very, very interesting book, which I'd absolutely recommend to anyone who's ever had any involvement with education, called Nature and the Human Soul by Bill Plotkin. And this is a book that's based on 25 years of research with indigenous communities about what a healthy childhood looks like, what a healthy adolescence looks like, and how to live sustainably without destroying the natural environment. So, very big tome like this, I will warn you. It's not something you can read in, you know, in, in a day, but it's absolutely worth reading. So we, we analysed some of the chapters of this book to see what was being suggested there as indicators of education for sustainable development in the broadest sense. We came up with an extremely long list, as you would imagine, of, of proto-indicators, about 450 proto-indicators. And we made the poor members of our work group work through them all and decide which ones they thought were extremely important. And we, so we've got a, a sub-list, which I'll show you in a second. And we also want to get secondary school teachers to prioritise them, which is what we're just trying to do now. I've got two schools that have expressed an interest. But if any of you are working with secondary schools in this country or anywhere that might be willing to go through a very long list of, of proto-indicators and put a tick by the ones they regard as extremely important, if nothing else, then that, that would be really appreciated. So that's what we're trying to get done right now. And um, These are just a few. This is just to give you a taster. I can't put them all up, obviously. These are the ones that were chosen by the Pearl Work Group. In fact, these are a subset of the ones that were chosen by the Pearl Work Group. So this is not everything by any means. But these, I thought I would just put them up. I'm not going to read through them all, but I'll just give you a, a few minutes to read them. And um, the theme came out from the meeting. This, this, this theme is called is Courage. And then there will be other, other themes which I'll put up. So th this, this is the first theme. You, I can send this round, as I say, so don't, don't worry about see them all, but just to give you some ideas. And uh, this is another theme, understanding. Um, this, this is just a subset here. There were lots and lots and lots of things that students would be expected to understand if they were enacting the values of ESD. Um, here is some on practical and environmental skills. So here's, here's some more indicators that can come, coming out from different sources. Th this whole um, toolkit that's been developed is, is an aggregation of all the six different sources. So th these are just some fairly randomly chosen ones that I've put up here. Uh, we've got emotional skills, uh, conflict resolution, which uh, you know, I would think is something quite critical, in, especially in a lot of these areas um, that the people have been talking about. One of the major challenges to, to overcoming the MDG, to, to, to um, attaining the MDGs, or whatever the successor is, is conflict. And so if we can actually teach conflict resolution skills and emotional skills in schools, then that, that would obviously be a very positive thing. 
There are other ESD skills, which, for example, in critical thinking, curiosity, conjecture, being able to synthesize education from different sources, uh, having a holistic view, being able to make everything interrelated, recognizing systems and patterns and so on. So th these are some that came out as, as high priority. Uh, self-knowledge, uh, we we'll, won't we'll go too much into this, but self-knowledge is another theme, and you can see some of the sample indicators for that. Yeah, cultural competence, so this again, and coming back to what uh, Caroline's saying about indigenous knowledge and African worldviews and so on. So trying to actually recognize some of these things that are inherent in culture. And connection to nature, which I think is so often missed in, in any discussion of education, but is, is absolutely crucial in environmental sustainability, is having that emotional connection to the natural world. And, and some of these words, um, there was a keynote speech at the Pearl meeting by David Selby, and he was talking very much about these words that are missing from the ESD language, things like enchantment and wonder and celebration, you know, we, we don't talk about them enough, and, uh, and these are things that are, are so critical to a sustainable future. So just to, to summarise then, that the three pillars model of sustainability we think is missing something, whatever you call it, we find it useful to think of it in terms of values. And um, People think that values can't be measured, but actually we believe that they can with some conditions. One of those conditions is that you're clear about the context that you're working in and the group of people that you're working with. And you can use interviews, you can use questionnaires and various sources of data to try to get a sense of what it is that people value. You can then develop, as you saw, proto-indicators. And that when you get into a particular setting, so for example in a school, you can then have workshops to get measurable indicators and assessment tools. So while it's, it, it's obviously very challenging and, and very far away from this world of global goals and global targets, this, this is very much about processes, it's very much about localization. But I think it would be great if in the forthcoming post-2015 goals there could be at least an openness to these kinds of approaches and not for everything to be always very top-down and very one-size-fits-all, but to, 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 to create spaces where people can explore whatever it is that they value and can create indicators together that are meaningful for them. Thank you. Fantastic. Lots, lots to think about. So maybe just spend a couple of minutes discussing in twos or threes, and then we'll have some Q and A and some comments. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs>